This is an American paratrooper. On August 16th of 1940, as the Second World War was raging overseas, 48 soldiers made the first official parachute jump to become America's first paratroopers. That first group of 48 would eventually evolve into five different airborne divisions that would serve in both theaters in World War II. They would be the 11th, the 13th, the 17th, the 82nd, and the 101st Airborne Divisions. Whenever you are studying World War II history, uh, one of the things that, that really captures your attention and imagination is the, uh, the, the new service that was developed during World War II of the Airborne Paratroopers. As a matter of fact, right now, I'm, I'm in uh, the, I guess, the Airborne Room or the Easy Company Room here at the Gettysburg Museum of History. Uh, you have all this stuff with the Dick Winters collection here. Uh, but Eric has a ton of artifacts that are tied to the Airborne that we are going to be taking a look at. have here are some genuine D-Day used parachutes and um, this is a complete T5 parachute it, it it's the complete pack um, the the ropes and the parachute and this is the reserve parachute that would go on the front this this harness would go across their body and then the, the reserve would go in the front so this is the main parachute this would be deployed upon an airborne soldier exiting the airplane and it was done with a static line and it would pull this pack out and the parachute would deploy now in a, in the case of the parachute malfunctioning, they would have this reserve chute that would be across their chest and they would pull that red um, handle right there and, and hopefully between the two they would get down. But mo most of the times the parachutes work fine. Um, the, the unique feature of this is that um, it, it, it is a true D-Day used set. and. The 101st Airborne marked all their airborne equipment with the initials of their commanding officer. So in this case, it's GVM, which is George Van Horn Mosley, who is the colonel of the 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne. And it's also stamped at various places. There's, there's a stamp right here, DVM. And so all the 502 uh, equipment will have that kind of a marking for the D-Day equipment and this is the reserve and again you see the GVM here. Now the, these uh, bungee cords here we have loosened a little bit and with these other strings to keep the tension off because over time they tend to break. So we did that to uh, preserve the item. And um, I'm going to show you another one. This is another D-Day reserve. And you'll notice that this one happens to say RS. And that is the initials of the commanding officer for the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, Robert Sink. So this is a 506 parachute. This is a 502 parachute, both from the 101st Airborne. One quick thing that I, that I want to mention that you know, some people might find interesting, uh, if, you, if you look at these hooks here on the front of this reserve chute, uh, well, as Eric mentioned, this would have gone on the, the front end of the paratrooper. And if we go back over here to the, the main harness, well, right here with these metal hooks, that is where your reserve chute uh, would have attached. This harness is um, made to keep a paratrooper in, and they're extreme. They were worn really tight. They had to adjust them. There's adjustment um, buckles here, and this would go over your shoulder, and then this hook here would be 
right at mid-level in your chest and, and as JD said these these would be for the reserve and then this part down here is almost like a swing it would it would go um, uh, where your where your butt is and your legs would go through here but they, they would have to be extremely tight and that would be so you would be able to um, not slip out of the parachute you ha you'd have a you know real thin guy or something somebody like Pee Wee Martin or something, you could slip right out of that with, with a severe shock that hits you when, when the canopy deploys. There's also a belly band here I failed to mention that, that straps right here that would go. And then this, ha this is another hook and you could hook your Griswold bag to that. They had bags that they would keep their rifles on and, and it had a, a hook similar to this that would go right here. Now. <clears throat> They recognized that this was a problem, having a rig this tight. Um, you know, the first thing you want to do when you land is to get out of that rig because it, you know, it keeps you from fighting. And, and if you, you're dropping into hostile territory, you want to be able to get out of that rig as quickly as possible. So um, right after the Normandy campaign, they developed a, uh, an improved version of this. It's called a bang box. It was a uh, a device that was um, you were able to lock it and then unlock it and it, and you would hit it and it was it would make the the straps come off real easily almost like a seat belt or something you know but it, it would lock so they improved this and uh, I remember being in Normandy with a 101st Airborne paratrooper named Norwood Thomas and he had told me that you know a lot of people got killed because of this um, inferior uh, clip here which they they improved later now the way these items got to our museum is quite a story I was over in Normandy um, about almost 10 years ago filming a TV show over there for the Travel Channel and I was in a military shop in uh, St. Marie de Mont and this parachute, the Robert Sinkwin, walked in and it was a French man there trying to sell it to the owner of the shop and um, I immediately recognized the initials and I asked the guy, is this what I think it is? And he said, yeah, and he said that there was a farmhouse nearby where um, one of the um, occupants had collected stuff as a young boy and this, this this person had passed away and the kids now have the items and stored in this farmhouse it was actually in a barn and I know people say it came out of a barn in Normandy yeah right well it, it did and we have photographs of it too um, there was a complete this complete um, T5 and there were four reserve parachutes and two canopies and I couldn't believe it I was like oh my gosh you know this is still packed from D-Day and, and it made me realize there's still a lot of stuff over here and I equated it with like if you know I would be back in Gettysburg being from here in 1938 around 75 years after the battle after the battle of Gettysburg there's still items around that families had so I I talked the owner of that business into selling this to me it took quite a bit of convincing because he did not want to sell it he was going to keep it for his own collection but um I guess I may have begged, I, I don't know, somehow I convinced him to sell it to me. And for about 10 years or 8 years, I, he, he owned this as well, this whole setup here. And finally, in, uh, we were, I was there for the 75th anniversary of D-Day, and um, I, I, I had gone there with the intention of making him an offer he couldn't refuse and basically there was a big auction in Normandy recently where they sold one of these and it went for an astronomical amount of money a lot of money and so I went up to him and I said okay auctions bring the highest price possible I will match that price and he thought about it because let me think about it anyway he ended up selling it to me I paid a lot of money for it but to me it's worth it you know knowing that this is an authentic rig, complete parachute rig, that brought a 101st Airborne 502nd soldier to the ground to fight in D-Day. It's just such a rare piece of equipment and such an iconic piece of equipment. Um, I didn't mind paying what I paid, so 
Um, it's one of my prized possessions here, and it's probably my, my, my favorite D-Day artifact. Again, what we are looking at here is the main chute that would have deployed whenever these paratroopers would have exited from uh, their, their C-47. And it's really interesting on this one, we can actually look at some of the markings and see that this was manufactured August 19th of 1943. Uh, now, on, on D-Day, most of the parachutes would have been uh, with, with this camouflage pattern, despite what you might see in some movies where, where they are white. Uh, the, the vast majority, if not all, were, were camouflaged. And I know what a lot of people might be thinking uh, as they were watching this video, how much did Eric have to pay for this rig? Uh, and I actually have the answer for you. Uh, that's none of your business. <laughs> I don't even know, and I didn't ask because it's none of my business. Uh, but anyway, that is the, the main chute. Now, if you go to the reserve chute, here, we'll just pull this flat back. Now, as you can see, the reserve chute is white, and uh, the, the paratroopers would have retained this reserve chute, and some of them, in a time whenever rationing was a, a big deal and resources were in short supply, found some very interesting uses for these reserve chutes. So some of the um, troopers did save their reserve chutes, you know, resources and material was low and um, things for, you know, some guys had ideas of making a wedding, having their, um, fiancés make wedding dresses out of the white material, the white silky material um, that was that was used in a reserve parachute. And there's a famous scene in Band of Brothers, which we've most of us have seen, where um, Lieutenant Harry Welsh is carrying around his reserve chute. I know Bill Garnier sent one home, or had someone send, send one home. Um, several other paratroopers did that. There's several examples of wedding dresses made out of parachutes. But what, what this one is, is a, a little girl's christening dress. And besides paratroopers, um, a lot of the French people in Normandy picked up parachutes as well. You can imagine, you know, there's thousands of these parachutes discarded all over Normandy. And these people who have been living under Nazi occupation for years um, and having pretty much everything taken from them by 1944, you know, everything was being used for the war effort for the Germans, so they, they didn't have a lot of cloth to make dresses at the time. So these Norman children and, and Norman people went around picking these things up, and this dress was made from a World War II reserve parachute, and it was made into, they said it was a christening dress, I'm not sure about that, that's verbal provenance, but it's, it's really interesting, and I've seen a few of them, we have actually, an, a couple of them in our collection and um, this is the dress and this is like a headpiece that would go around her head and then what we have here is a symbol for the free French so uh, the freedom that the American paratroopers brought to the French people was appreciated and that was a symbol of, of the freedom and the kind of an anti-Nazi kind of situation but I found this, or actually, my beloved girlfriend Cheryl found this in a shop in Normandy when we were there several years ago, and um, and I, I just loved it. I already had one, but this one was a lot better, in my opinion. It was m more well made, and they had it in a, a little frame, and they, they had another pair. You know, this is um, the camouflage parachute material behind it, and so we, she bought it for me for Christmas. It's one of my favorite things. There, there, there are some period photos of French children wearing these dresses, um, and uh, it's 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 just one of those unknown kind of artifacts that are from the the Normandy that that most people aren't aware of, and and um, I, I cherish it also because. Um, Cheryl got it for me, my girlfriend. Those of you who've been to the museum, some of you have met her. All right, so uh, that is a little bit of uh, the, the gear that the airborne troopers would have used during the, the Normandy campaign. Uh, I, I really like looking at, at artifacts like this because it's, it's another one of those little small pieces of the puzzle that helps me to understand the, the bigger picture. 
Uh, all kinds of, of airborne stuff here at, at this museum uh, that, that you can see whenever you come to Gettysburg. But yeah, very cool.